All right, so welcome everyone to the JB Media Digital Drop-In. I'm so excited to have you all here today to talk about getting started with Google Analytics 4. So just to go over a few housekeeping things, we're gonna run through till one o'clock. I wanna encourage everyone, if you just joined, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Also, as most of you know, going forward, we're gonna be having free webinars as usual, the first Wednesday of every month. And we often have classes as well each month to learn different topics. But as we come to the end of the summer where we've taken a little bit of a break, I'm sharing a survey link and I'm gonna share this at the end as well. But I'd love for everyone to take like one minute and complete the survey. You can give me your name and email if you'd like, or you can leave it anonymous. And what we're hoping to find out is whether or not you're going to want further classes on this topic, if there's any topics you'd like us to address before the end of the year. So especially for those of you who come on a regular basis to our digital drop-ins, I would love, love, love to get your opinions about what you would like us um, to be doing as we come to the end of 2022. So again, it should only take Take a minute, maybe two. It's just like three multiple choice questions. And you can tell me if there's anything you'd like us to do in the future um, around different topics for classes and free webinars. So again, I'm going to share that link and I will share it at the end as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I want to invite everyone, again, if you have questions as we go throughout today, I will be monitoring the Q&A. So I'd appreciate questions because this is a technical subject that we put those in the Q&A instead of the chat. Um, but again, I would love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat, say hello. And of course, if you put any questions in the chat, I'm not going to just ignore them. I will definitely try to keep track of it. So again, so excited um, to see Bill here. Welcome uh, to see Mary and Glenn, um, to see Julie. So we've got people from all over and I'm so excited to have you here. And again, I'll share the survey at the end so you can provide some feedback to us before we wrap up today. So like I said, our topic for today is getting started with Google Analytics 4. And I'm just going to be honest with everyone that this is a topic that I'm excited to talk about. It's also a topic that I'm finding to be like the most taxing part of my world right now. So I just want us all to be aware that this system is going to create a learning curve. We have basically 11 months to really get on board with it and understand it. So I'm so proud of you all for being here and thinking a whole year ahead. So July 1st, 2023 is when they're going to remove universal analytics um, as the primary system. And as far as I know, they will be keeping universal analytics up. So you will have access to your historical data on that system. It just won't continue tracking after July 1st. And so just to start us off, I wanna say if you've been using universal analytics and you haven't really maximized that data, but maybe you've had it running for a year or three years or five years or 10 years, Really, this would be a great year to maximize everything you can using universal analytics, right? So if you have historical data there, if you've never analyzed it, if you've never really spent any time digging into it, um, I just want to encourage you to do that, to really utilize that information as much as possible as we go through our final year of having access. But even though this is a big learning curve and it's driving me insane to try to learn everything, at the same time, like I said, there's some really powerful changes that are so exciting about this new system and this sort of new paradigm of thinking when it comes to tracking and reporting. So what's changed? Everything has basically changed, right? So Google Analytics 4 really changes the data structure that we're used to and the data collection logic. So our language is changing, the layout of how we look at the analytics is changing. Um, there's just all sorts of different things that are shifting uh, right now. And so we're gonna have to, like I said, sort of enter a new paradigm if that's possible as we're thinking about these topics. 
Everything is built around users and events, not sessions. So if you're familiar with universal analytics, you know that we often look at the number of users, they produce a number of sessions, then they produce a number of page views and so on and so forth. We're gonna move away from that entirely. We're gonna start thinking about users, or I would rather call them people, and we're gonna be thinking about events, which we're gonna talk about in detail. So each person becomes a generator of events, right? So every interaction that a person has on your website is now an event that Google Analytics will track. And so again, this is a pretty historic change. And just so you know, I see the questions in the Q&A and I will definitely get to those. Um, I wanna just get through some things before we start doing that. But essentially, this is a really historical change because that session-based model has kind of guided everything for years and years, right? And so that sort of perspective of looking at from the beginning of the 90s hits, right? And then looking at page views and looking at sessions and things like that, we're really gonna move away from that and, and sort of approach their activity on your website as really truly behavior, right? And one of the other things that's really strong about this particular new system is that now if you are a company with a website and an app or multiple websites, you're going to be able to use GA4 to really track as people move through all your properties. And so that's a big deal to a lot of larger companies um, because really they want to be able to see that relationship, right? And for most of you, you already know, but at the end of this digital drop-in today, I will send out to everybody who's registered a copy of my slides and the recording. And so there are a ton of amazing resources in this slide deck for you to click on. So cross-platform experience is a big part of the changes. The other two things that I think have really guided um, the changes to Google Analytics are privacy and security and just the laws and legislation around that. So the consumer expectation of privacy and security and the actual legal ramifications of what's happening as our laws literally shift and change. The other big thing that's happening with this system is we're gonna have more artificial intelligence built in to Google Analytics. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, but that is kind of a powerful, amazing new part of the system that I think is gonna grow as we move forward. And it has to do with the system tracking everyone's behavior on your website and the activity or the events that they're completing. And then essentially using the AI to predict certain things, right? So being able to predict um, what might happen in the future with your website based on people's current behaviors. And so that I think is gonna be a really powerful change, right? So you can see machine learning is a big part of GA4. That's the artificial intelligence. We've got cross device and cross platform reporting, and we have moving into the event-based data model. So Google Analytics is changing from a measurement perspective, from a reporting perspective, and from an automation perspective. So even though the learning curve, like I said, is on one level infuriating, and for me, it's just taking a long time. I wish it was like, I could learn it by osmosis, right? Um, at the same time, I think the end result is gonna be stellar for all of us. And so when you can start to just understand kind of these shifts, um, I think it's going to help you approach the new system um, differently, right? Because you really are going to take this session-based model that we've been working on, and you're going to have to, like I said, shift your paradigm over to this event-based model. But in my world, this shift that we're taking from session to event-based means that we're actually putting people first, right? That's our primary goal here is to put people first in a lot of ways. And so I'm really glad about this. And you can see these screenshots in the slide deck are taken directly from Google's website. So it gives you a little bit of an understanding of where they're coming from. So key things that Google wants you to know with Google Analytics for properties, you're gonna be able to create new audiences and you'll have more options for defining and segmenting these audiences. So this is gonna be more about people who are doing e-commerce, people who are doing higher level conversion tracking, um, and people who are willing to go to doing the work 
of tagging and using UTM parameters. So it's not like they're just going to give you audiences for free. We're not going to be able to spy on people and get their emails and stuff. That's obviously the opposite direction of where we're going. But as we start to dig into the events and what we can actually track, you're going to see that we're going to be able to gather more behavioral and demographic information here. Um, it's also going to collect and store user interactions with your business as events, right? Like I said, so that we can actually use analytics to understand the behavioral activities that are going on. And the GA4 properties are going to allow us to bring a lot of different things together across devices and platforms. So if you are managing an app along with you know, websites, or you've got multiple websites, you're going to uh, have a much easier time doing that in the future. So if you're a privacy nerd, this does come from a place um, of Google saying that they're really going to push for more privacy or getting rid of cookies all around, which some um, browsers have already done. And so this is something, like I said, that even though it's frustrating right now on one level, um, I think it's going to be better for all of us as the people who use the internet and use websites as marketers. Uh, I think it treats the customer with the highest level of respect and concern. And so you can dig into this and understand a little bit more um, about the user privacy and also, like I said, the machine learning and the AI that's going to be part of this. And so they're going to want to protect the identities and the personal information of people. But when it comes to their behavior and activity, they're going to try to amplify um, what it is that we can understand um, and predict from what they're doing, right? So that becomes a really exciting piece. So should you set up GA4 now? I'd love to see how many of you, um, if you want to just drop it in the chat, already have GA4 set up on your sites and are already using it. Um, it is pretty straightforward to set up. The answer is yes, get it set up now. You'll want to start letting the AI build your data at this moment. And you don't have to turn off universal, right? So yeah, I see a lot of people are um, getting it going. And Alyssa, yeah, I will say you can double check in the real time stats to see if you've set it up and it's actually pulling data on a website, right? Um, and so, you know, basically you can run these two things together for the next year. And, you know, like I said, because privacy and security are kind of becoming a bigger thing, that's why I think we want to capitalize on the things that Universal is giving us that we probably are not going to have down the road. Um, while we learn what GA4 is going to provide for us. And it is okay to set it up and not use it right away. So it is worth it, even if you set it up now, if you can't start playing with it for another three months or six months, that's totally fine, right? So you're able to um, really let the AI and machine learning start its work by getting these things running together. And the overall idea is better data collection means better informed marketing strategies, right? So the basics of configuring GA4, I've outlined them for you. We don't have time today to dig into these in detail, but you can use this slide deck as a literal reference to go in. If you have universal analytics, go into your property and use the setup wizard to actually create your Google Analytics for a um, property and get the information you need to put the code on your website, right? And then I've included some screenshots of the GA4 setup assistant and just what you're gonna see as you walk through the process, right? So clicking the get started button, right? All the things that are described in that little list, you're gonna see it gives you the wizard, it tells you to create the property. And then the last piece of this puzzle will actually be adding this to your website. Um, and, you know, that is done in different ways, depending on what kind of website you have. So with WordPress, there might be plugins with Squarespace, there's settings with Wix, there's settings. If you have a web designer, you should be able to just give them the code and they can add it. Um, Susie, I see your question. You just started running and I'm assuming GA4 on your author website for maybe three months. Will 15 ish months of data still be useful or should I just catch the four wave? Um, Absolutely, you should have GA4 set up this week if you can do it, right? So hopefully that's I'm following the question. But yeah, nobody should be waiting for anything. Um, if you have a website, if you've already got Universal Analytics or you've never added analytics before, you want to get GA4 set up and you want to let it run and you want to start learning 
how it works. So let me know if that's um, not exactly what you were asking. Um, Shanna, I see your question. Does the site's historical data get erased or not taken into account when switching to GA4? So from right now, my understanding is Universal Analytics ends July 1st, 2023. It will never track anything again after that. GA4 starts when you set it up. So there's no crossover. They're completely different systems. That's why you want to be running them simultaneously right now for the next year so that you'll have two different forms of data collection and you won't, you'll be actually learning more than you've ever learned this year, probably if you're paying attention to your analytics. So Google has said for now that they're going to be leaving universal analytics historical data up indefinitely. Um, you know, so I would say we should have plenty of time to keep playing with UA. Um, even after we've switched over to GA4 if we want to, but they're not gonna be connected. So GA4 is not gonna take anything into account from my understanding from Universal Analytics. So again, feel free to add to the Q&A again if something doesn't quite make sense. Um, Glenn, will Google for incorporate Search Console with analytics? That is a question that I have not found an answer to. So the way that I could take Universal Analytics and connect it to my Search Console, I have not seen that setting yet. It could pop up at any time. I have not seen an area where it's gonna display. And I'm not so sure Google's gonna think that we need to do that. I personally never look at the search console inside of my analytics. I always do my SEO work inside of the search console. So I have a feeling they may decide that the new GA4 and the search console are really serving different purposes and they don't need to be integrated. But again, we have a full year, so we'll see what they decide. And then, Susie, I see your part two. You have an email in your inbox right now that says to set up GA4. If I set it up, does it start GA4 mode? And should I actually click that button? So yes, what should happen if you're getting an email for analytics, which means you probably already have an account on analytics, maybe from Universal. When you get that email, if you click on it, it'll make you log in. You have to make sure you're logged into the right Google account. But if you are, then it'll just walk you through that whole setup process that I showed you in the slides, right? So it's literally just trying to make it easier for you so you don't have to go research it. You just click that get started walk through getting the code and setting up the property, but then you're gonna to have to add the code to your website. So don't forget that last step, otherwise you're not completing the circle, right? And then when a user requests deletion of data, how do we handle that since they are now events? Okay, Renee, that's a question that I'm not sure I have the answer to, um, mainly because all right, so I'm gonna to try to keep this short and maybe you can email me after um, with additional questions so I can understand what you're asking about. But technically speaking, when somebody's on your website, if they don't, if you have Google Analytics, you should have an alert, like a GDPR style alert that tells people that they're being tracked and they should leave your website if they don't want that. Google Analytics isn't storing any personal information about the person necessarily, right? At least nothing right now that is, um, I think outside of those parameters. So like all that you're getting in Google Analytics by itself is just like the person as a user, right? They're like an unknown user. Um, you won't be able to correlate them with anybody specifically. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to remove a single person's data out of your analytics. They needed to just leave the website <laughs> so they weren't tracked and you needed to let them know that they were being tracked, if that makes sense. Now, if you're collecting data, like they're signing up for something, they have a user account and then you're storing that data, that's where you have to remove them entirely. Um, and so what you're talking about with the events is it sort of connects this, right? An event might be somebody creating a user account. An event might be, um, them signing up for something. And when they do that event, they give you the information, like their email, their name, their business name, anything like that. But that is not stored in Google Analytics, that's stored on your website. So do you follow um, how I'm kind of talking about this? Because the question you're asking, I'm not so sure that that question is the right question. Only because I don't think that it's like, I call a company and I say, I want you to remove my data from your storage. I want it deleted from your system, that I can delete them from a Google Analytics because Google Analytics isn't telling me who is who they are. 
right? And so that's where, feel free to email me and we can talk about it more. So I understand a little bit more about what data you're collecting and what it is that they're asking to be removed from. And then Shanna, I see, um, oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that, that shout out, Shanna. Um, so Glenn, Shanna's correcting me that what she found is that Google Analytics 4, I assume is what you mean, and Search Console can be connected down using the Data Studio, which is a new um, tool. Uh, they've had it for a while, but it's a tool that I haven't used as much. I just started using it this year. So that might be a way if you wanna expand. Data Studio will actually bring a lot of different things together. So thank you for reminding me of that. Um, that's definitely, I think, a, a major thing when it comes to uh, one of the changes they're making. They won't necessarily need to collect and connect analytics to Search Console because the Data Studio is allowing me to pull in a bunch of different things. Analytics, Search Console, Google Tag Manager, um, advertising tools, um, things like that. So definitely check out Google Data Studio. For some of us who are only using Search Console and Google Analytics 4, I do want to say that I feel like the data studio might be overkill um, to learn it. Um, you know, that's just something to think about uh, because it, it might be easier just to learn those two tools and not uh, data studio on top of it if you're not going to be using the other types of things that data studio pulls in. Um, and Halima, no problem. I see your question just about um, Google's no longer using cookies. The individual sites have to manually activate cookies on each site. Um, so cookies, I think cookies are done. We don't want to have cookies anymore, right? And we're going to talk about first party data. Um, but essentially, I think that I feel like what you're asking is, can an individual site allow people to say, we'll give your website permission to give put cookies on us? Um, I don't think that's how it's going to work. I'm not an expert on that, uh, but I feel like we actually just need to release the idea of cookies. We need to really think about good, solid first party data collection if we want to know more about people and we want to use tracking systems. There are others besides Google Analytics out there, so they're not the only game in town, but they are one of the only free games in town. So let me know again if that doesn't completely answer the question you're asking um, or I'm misunderstanding what you're talking about. So thank you for all those questions. Um, for those of you who know me, I love that rapid fire. It gets me excited um, to try to put my brain to the test. Um, and so Glenn, so <laughs> That is like a deeper thing that I, again, don't really have the answer to. So I wanna go through um, explaining how this works, but um, Firefox had already gotten rid of cookies. Google has been saying they've been getting rid of cookies for like two or three years. Um, they've been slowly working it out of Chrome. Um, so this idea of cookie tracking is dead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from a tech perspective anyway, if you're keeping up with things, cookies are just something that are questionable from a security and privacy um, world, and we have totally shifted our paradigm on how we're tracking data. And so I don't really understand what that shift is because Google, I mean, I might not be smart enough, I think from a development standpoint, sometimes understand Google's explanation about that. Um, but maybe a programmer could give you a little more understanding of exactly what this new stuff is that they're using um, to keep track of things. You'll notice there's a lot more um, there's a lot more options for your phone, especially if you're an iPhone user. Um, there's a lot more things where now you have to tell a company or organization that you are comfortable being tracked. You have to be alerted that you're being tracked on your website. So again, nowadays, if you're using Google Analytics, you want to add to your website something that lets people know that you are doing that tracking. And you want to have a privacy policy on your website that explains what you do with information about your users. So if you don't do anything with it, you wanna say that. We never sell this, we never share this, we don't use it for anything, right? Um, same thing when you collect emails. Uh, and so, you know, how do websites ask permission, which is another question here. Um, that's gotta be like a pop-up on your website sometimes. Sometimes it's on the bottom. Sometimes it's just a notification across the top. Um, but a lot of times you want to have a notification somewhere in the site for the person who lands there when they first get there, that they see that 
and they can say yes, right? And so what we were doing for GDPR and for email marketing has now like really expanded in a lot of ways. And yeah, Glenn, just so you know, great challenge for me though, to go study a little more deeply on the tech and understand it. Um, and thanks, Shanna, I really appreciate it. So yeah, so basically she just shared Google's answer. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing those links. I really appreciate it, Shanna. That really helps because I know a lot about marketing, but I'm not exactly like the greatest technician when it comes to uh, work on the system. I'm not a developer. I'm a faux developer, just to be clear. Um, I hang out with a lot of developers. <laughs> So essentially, I've put together, like I said, some great slides here, just explaining events in more detail, because I think this is where, um, you know, I think events, understanding sort of, like I said, this new paradigm, where we don't really look at sessions, we look at, you know, the people and each interaction that they have. And there are different types of events that you can set up in the system. This has a lot to do with what we formerly thought of as conversion tracking in the old system. Um, most people, I think events existed in universal analytics, but most people didn't really dive into that because it was a little more advanced um, and it was a little bit more difficult to DIY. And so now what's gonna have to happen is we're all gonna be forced to really understand this um, better. And yeah, so Alyssa, just to let you know, so Google, if you, I don't know the exact date, but they've been announcing for three years that they're getting rid of cookies. When they get rid of cookies, you don't need cookie notification banners necessarily, right? If, they, if you're using cookies on your own website, you don't need those anymore because they're not going to function really in a lot of ways on any of the browsers. So if they don't function on any of the browsers, it's hard for them to work in any way. Um, and so it shouldn't be required after that, but right now I would leave it mostly because they're still ex in existence on Google. Like I said, Firefox, I think, got rid of them entirely. So if you're looking at websites on Firefox, it doesn't allow cookies. I, there's another, um, I can't, I'm pretty sure it's Safari that took away cookies already as well. I'd have to double check that. Um, but I know Google Chrome is going to be the next one probably to remove that. But events are categorized into these four different categories, right? Automatically collected events, enhanced measurement events, recommended events, and custom events. The first two are the places where I think small businesses can play. And that's because automatically collected events are now, we're going to consider something like a page view, an event. It's an interaction from a person. When they start the visit or the session to the website, if they're coming to the website for the first time, these are now going to be considered automatically collected events. They are interactions that people have on your website that Google will automatically put into the system. Enhanced measurement events are automatically collected events that you have to turn on in your settings, and they are a little bit more advanced. Luckily, there's no coding involved with these new enhanced measurement events. So scrolls, site searches, video engagement, and outbound clicks, you can enable or disable these on your website or your app. Now, depending on how things are built, you're gonna have to explore how you get all these things to work properly. Um, right now, Google's making it sound like it's all just gonna play perfectly out of the box. I never trust them that that's the case, but I'm excited to see these enhanced measurement of events don't require a lot of coding, tagging, extra work, right? It's actually a setting. And I think what matters most is how active your website is. If you have a very, very tiny website with very few people on it, it's often harder for Google to collect enough data to start to really utilize some of their enhanced measurements and to do anything predictive, right? So when your website's really small, sometimes you'll see there's parts of Google Analytics in the past that haven't really registered, like there's sort of data that doesn't show there. I do think we're going to see a little of that in the future where, you know, you've got to build up your website's traffic so it's pretty consistent and regular before the whole system really starts to work for you. But for those of us who've had websites for a while, even if it's a small business, um, it's not, a, you know, you're not getting hundreds of thousands of visitors a month. You're just getting hundreds or a few thousand. You should still see some real value out of the enhanced measurement events. If you're in e-commerce, 
website or you are wanting to really customize what it is that you're tracking on your website. So things that people do, you want to track all these different things. Do they sign up for this? Do they log in here? Do they click this button? Do they watch this video? This is where you can get into custom events. This is where we're going to find more conversations about analytics funnels, where I can track if somebody went through like a six step process, right? So if you haven't done much advanced e-commerce and conversion checking in the past, recommended events and custom events probably won't apply to you out of the gate. Those first two are gonna be really valuable. And so again, I just included some of Google's commentary on enhanced measurement events, how you go into your admin on GA4, you go to the property, that's the website that you wanna edit or the app you wanna edit, you go into your data streams and you look for the enhanced measurement setting and you turn that on and then there'll be some steps um, from there where you edit some individual options depending on what it is that you're trying to track on your website now again this puts us back to that conversation of how important it is for all of us to really think about when people get to our website and even on each page when they're on each page what do we want them to do because what we want them to do becomes the event that we want to try to track and see that it's happening, right? So it's really important this year, I think, to go back to your website and really think, what are the pages of my website? What is the purpose of these pages? And when people land on these pages, what do I want them to do? Do I want them to read a bunch of content and stay there for at least five minutes? Do I want them to see this opportunity and click on it? Do I want them to watch the great video that we created? Um, because literally what we hope that our visitors are gonna do is literally the events that we want to try to build out into our GA4. Now you'll see in this list from Google, events and parameters. So you'll see here, this is sort of the event itself, right? What's triggered and the sort of name of the event that Google's using and then the parameters we use. So this has to do with how Google in the automatically and enhanced measurement events, how it's adjusting parameters to track different things through these code pieces, right? Um, and it also indicates a little bit about how if you wanted to customize something, you have to learn how to write in these sort of code parameters into your own website on your URLs so that buttons are recognized as an event, right? Google's going to do some of this, um, but if you want to have more control over what's being looked at, you're going to have to dig into that. And so again, this is where, and I really appreciate, again, that link that was shared about what does it mean to live in a cookie-less world? A lot of it has to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So that's why I said it's a little above my full understanding of how stuff actually works. Um, and I was correct, it's Safari that blocked them um, along with Firefox. But essentially, the new GA4 is powered by artificial intelligence insights, right? And so they're not just gonna be tracking, the AI is gonna be tracking behavior. It's also, like I said, going to be predicting behavior potentially. And I'm excited to see what happens from a predictive perspective. I haven't worked on a website yet where that is actually um, producing data yet. And so I'm excited to see what that looks like in another six months. And then you'll see I've put together just the steps that go into setting up conversions and event tracking. Again, that's more customized. Um, I know that again, this might not apply to everyone, um, but you're really gonna wanna dig into kind of understanding, you know, that you have to have these sort of um, codes, these tags uh, that actually attach themselves to different parts of the website so that you can see when something is happened, um, right? And like, again, Google's already doing this with some of the automatically created stuff, and then we can take it to the next level by customizing that stuff. And that's really, like I said, where we get into uh, UTM parameters and UTM codes. This is where you might learn, um, if you want to get more advanced in your tracking over time, that you want to take time to get to know the Google Tag Manager and pull that in as a third sort of piece to your tracking and reporting, right? The Google Tag Manager allows you to, to go in and really tag things yourself without being a coder. Still a big learning curve. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sort of an intermediate user of Google Tag Manager, um, but essentially, you know, there's a big learning curve, but it does remove your need for potentially 
uh, to hire a programmer, right, to do some of this more custom coding. And for those of you who aren't really familiar with UTM codes or parameters, you know, these are just letters and characters that are added to the ends of your URLs, right? And they sort of tell Google Analytics more information about the link and about what type of marketing campaign you're doing. A lot of times, a good example of this would be when you're in MailChimp uh, or Constant Contact, you can usually add a little um, UTM code or tag to your email marketing so that when people click over from MailChimp, you have an easier time seeing that little identifier at the end of the URL, right? Facebook actually uses this a lot in their advertising. So when people are clicking on Facebook ads and I see it in Google Analytics, I can often see the little Facebook um, UTM parameters showing in my links, which is how I know that they're coming from Facebook ads that we're working on. So. Again, it's a little more technical in this world. We are all gonna be forced to kind of understand what these things mean. Um, but I do think in the next year, if we really put some time and energy into this, we really think about it as businesses, we start to strategize our websites, what really defines our website as successful? What activities, what interactions are really defining our success? If we can do some of that strategy work and really get to know GA4 and be prepared to start looking at what events are already set up, what enhanced events can we use? Are there any other events that we want to customize, especially if we're e-commerce? Do we want some stronger tracking around sales and where we lose people in the actual checkout process and things like that? And so you can use, again, this slide deck as a guideline and come in here and read very specifically about these different event pieces. And like I said, I would sort of stack them, like go in and look at the automated ones, learn about that, learn about making sure those events are tracking correctly, look at the enhanced measurement events, and then think about what other things are not included in what Google is giving us um, that we want to add, especially from a conversion standpoint. So I'm going to stop sharing real quick. And I just wanna give everybody a, a live view of the new GA4. And again, feel free to add in any questions if you have them. I know somebody had talked to me before this digital drop in about whether or not there are filters inside of the system to filter out like your own IP address, right? Um, which used to be in universal analytics inside of um, these sort of areas in your property settings. And you'll see if you have an account Again, you can have an account as a business with multiple properties. So multiple websites, multiple, a website and some apps, all of those different things. We do still have the filters option here, but when I've been clicking on it, um, I haven't been able to get in and really kind of dig into what the options are. You can see here that it just tells me filters cannot be applied to Google Analytics for properties. So I don't know if they're leaving that section simply because of universal analytics or if down the road there will be some kind of filtering system. Um, and again, to all of you, what we're talking about is when, let's say, you can take the IP address of your office and the people who work there and filter it out of your reporting. That way you're not tracking your own staff while they're on your website, right? Um, yeah, thanks, Alyssa. And so, yeah, essentially you were talking about the bots, exactly. And so that's what I was getting to, is right now I don't see a way to get those IP addresses from bots and basically, you know, remove them in any way. Cause when I go in, it says I can't do that. Now I'm still looking into all these settings inside of here to see if there's anything in there that would allow us to address bots. And I have submitted some questions. So you and I, again, you can always email me and we can talk about that stuff in a little more detail. Um, my hope would be that Google Analytics AI is gonna do such a good job the bots are a problem of the past, right? That would be kind of amazing if we could just have Google get rid of all the bot traffic. Seems to me that some of their engineers think their AI is alive. And if their AI is that smart, it should be able to tell the difference between bots and actual users. So <laughs> I'm gonna hope that even though sometimes I think we're risking ending up in a Terminator film with the artificial intelligence at Google uh, and Facebook at the same time, if we could risk the Terminator films coming true, but we could get rid of all the annoying bot traffic in the world, um, I might 
personally as a marketer, I feel like that risk is worth it. <laughs> So essentially when you get in here, like I said, I just wanted you to see kind of this short, like simpler version of analytics that GA4 involves. This is a brand new website, so we don't have a lot of information here. And so I'm sorry that we can't see again some predictive stuff. But when you get on your home, you'll see there's just these simple areas, reports, explore, advertising, and configure. If I go into configure, um, this is where I'm going to be able to add events, conversions, audiences, and dig into some of the more advanced things that are here, right? And again, the audience thing, I'm still kind of uh, understanding more of because there's some things that automatically populate here. Um, again, in audiences, we're not talking about getting personal information about people. You can see here what they've automatically created is all users and purchasers, but it's funny, this is not an e-commerce website. So that's obviously an automated sort of group that they create. Um, but really where you can spend some time out of the gate is the events. These were all automatically built in when I launched GA4 for this website, right? And so, you know, essentially you can see clicking, first visits, mail to, page view. There are some things when you start to turn these on that you're going to have to make sure you've got things set up properly for them to work, but it should be fairly straightforward for most of these automatically tracked things. And if you go into your settings, like I explained in the admin and turn on enhanced measurement, you'll probably see that go further. When we get into conversions, that is where I think we start getting into things that are gonna require more of that custom coding. Conversions have always required that. Now over here under reports, this is where most of us are going to find what we're looking for from our previous use of universal analytics from a marketing perspective. So looking at acquisition, where did we get our traffic? This is where I can see things like direct versus organic search versus different types of organic social media, right? I still have my date ranges up here, so I can adjust the date range if I want to look at longer amounts of time. But you'll notice there's automatic channel groupings, organic social, organic search, direct. Um, again, this is a brand new website, so I haven't seen all of this kind of, I don't have examples of how this all breaks down when you've got many, many different types of um, websites sending you traffic. But I would expect we'll see a lot of what we saw previously, things that identify email, things that identify um, other types of places where the traffic is coming from, right? And so acquisition, that's an old sort of terminology. We still got some of that going on. I think just how we go through this. Um, and Marianne, I'll get to that question at the end. Um, essentially, you know, we're just having to redo a little bit of this language. So there'll be slight changes in here. Um, but you'll see sessions, engage sessions. Engage sessions is something I love, right? So this is the number of sessions that lasted longer than 10 seconds or had a conversion event or the person looked at two or more screens on an app or pages um, on a website, right? So you can also roll over these if you see that they have changed a little bit, right? And you can basically see kind of what the new Google definition is of these things. But acquisition, I think, is going to be one of the easier places to really um, go and feel comfortable right now because it's, even though it's like different on the left hand side, once you start digging in, the data sort of makes sense. So, some of that basic understanding of where are we getting our traffic, where are people coming from on the web, we're going to see that. Engagement is a new spot, but this is where we're really going to be able to see again things that are more usability focused. So how long are people staying on the website? Um, what is the average? How many people are engaged versus not engaged, right? Which means they're at under 10 seconds. But this is also where we're gonna see some of the stuff we used to look for under behavior, which is the most popular pages of the website. And one thing that I will say is, so here you can see they've got the page title. Um, just for those of you who are like me, I know it's really hard sometimes because I don't always remember the page titles. So I can come in here and I can say, I want to see the page path. And this is going to bring me back to URLs. So some of you might be better at page titles. Some of you might be more like me and geeky. And I'm always, I'm so used to looking at the, the URLs. I prefer to do that. Um, 
But this is where, again, you're going to be able to see some of those usability indicators. Is the site really keeping people on the site? Are they looking at multiple pages? Again, if you've got events that you've set up, you'll be able to see events, how many are being done. You can see even though this website just launched and it's pretty little, they haven't really pushed it out yet because they've got a little pause button before they start announcing it. There's already these automatically tracked events that we can see. Right, and so I can see some information about how people are reacting to the new design. Then, of course, if you get into monetization, this is where you would go if you're e-commerce based, if you're doing a lot of online sales. And then we have this new user area where you have demographics and tech. And this is where you used to find stuff in the audience section, right? So we're going to be able to see all the locations they're coming from. Um, Gender and interest, you know, that was always a sketchy part of uh, universal analytics. I'm still figuring out what is required for this to be tracked in some way. No data has shown up in my systems yet. Um, and so I don't know if that's going to be attached to advertising stuff or, you know, if it's going to be attached to making sure that you've got certain parameters set up. We'll see. But some of the basic things we will already have, right? This, the country, city, state, um, will be there, languages will be there, and then what types of devices and browsers they're using will also be there. So I know I have a few more questions that I'm going to go ahead and talk about. I know folks are going to have to potentially go right at one o'clock, so I do just want to show you the rest of the resources I've put into your slide deck. We're doing a quick overview live, but I did want you to know that I put in some screenshots there with some overviews of what it's going to look like when there's bigger amounts of data. Um, and so that's really exciting, breaking down some of the stuff in that left hand menu that's new, right? And this is kind of changing as we go along. So you can see some of the systems I have have a few extra options. They're still refining everything, so don't be afraid of that. And then just some information about that predictive piece. And if you've ever done custom reporting or dashboards, you're going to have this new area called the analysis hub. That's going to replace that piece. Also, I've put in some great information about the value of first party data. And so I really want you to just dig into that when you have time. Listen to Google um, because I've really taken some things directly from them about what it is that they care about as they're creating the new system and some information about Google Tag Manager. And then again, I want to um, just encourage everybody to, I'll share the survey link. If you could just share with us a little bit more um, about what it is that you um, would like to do in classes and webinars before um, you're done for the day today, that'd be great. But you've also got tons of resources in here about classes and things that I'm offering. And then you have my email. And so you are welcome to reach out to me anytime because I know this is a big subject, but I wanted us to kick it off. I'll probably be doing more webinars about this in the future. So um, definitely be ready to dig deeper into things like events and so forth. Um, and again, I'm going to go ahead and share this survey link just because if you could all um, help me out to focus in on whether or not you'd like a deeper class on this topic would be great. And other topics that you're interested in, as far as webinars and classes, I would just really appreciate the feedback anytime. But I know we've got more questions. If you need to leave at one o'clock, I wanna just give you the ability to go. Thank you so much. If you complete the survey, I really appreciate it. Use my email, hit me up if you've got questions, especially those of you who had some that were more technical. I'm glad to talk by email and see if I can provide some support. Um, Marianne, your question, can you explain direct versus organic SEO? So I think what you mean is in analytics, the difference between direct traffic versus organic search traffic. So go ahead and add to the Q&A if I'm wrong about that. But direct traffic is people who already knew about your website. So they didn't come from anywhere else. They just clicked a link that they already had. Um, maybe it was bookmarked. Maybe it was sent in an email to them. Maybe they just went to the browser and typed it in. That's direct traffic. Organic search traffic means somebody looked for something, either your company name or potentially just a general keyword that related to your products and services and your business. And when they searched for it on Google or Yahoo or Bing 
or DuckDuckGo or any of the other search engines, and it directed that, you know, they basically saw your result and clicked on it, that is traffic that comes from organic search. So I hope that clarifies those pieces of data. Um, and then I see, okay, I see maybe the chat is, the chat is working for me. So I'm sorry if it keeps disabling itself. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Um, but basically this question, Ashley, how far back will GA4 go once installed? No, all analytics starts the day you set it up. There's no back data. So you can't go backwards. Uh, it's never been true about Universal and it's not gonna be true about GA4. So your tracking starts the day the code gets set up on your website, usually starts to populate um, probably like within a couple of days. So Jennifer, really quick, um, I'm gonna hold that. Uh, I don't really have tips. Again, you can email me uh, for people that have two related websites more than set them up in GA4 under the same account so that you have one account for Moog with two properties, right? One for Moog Foundation, one for Moog Xam. Then from there, um, I'd really have to have more of a deeper conversation to try to understand what you guys want to cross track and things like that. Krista, yes, you always get access to a link um, to the presentation as well as the recording. And I send that out usually two or three days after our digital drop-in. So Glenn, your question, will GA4 give us the landing pages that people found our site from? So that was the area that I pointed out to you is basically under engagement. There's a section called pages and screens. And pages and screens is now where you would find like under behavior, the landing pages that people are hitting. Now, what I haven't seen inside of here is any way um, quite yet for like me to be looking at organic search traffic or like social traffic, clicking on Facebook and then clicking on landing pages, right? I don't see that yet. I'm still playing around with the secondary dimensions, um, but I do think we can trust them that if we're trying to associate, um, you know, basically, our, our, where we acquired the traffic, the channel, with where they ended up, um, I'm sure that there's going to be a way for us to add in some type of additional columns. So I've seen that I can add additional columns, which originally were called secondary dimensions. Hopefully, they'll still be allowing that. Um, but the first place I would start looking at is that pages and screens. That's where I showed you, like, you can see the title of the page of the website, or you can click over and see the path, and that'll give you the URLs. And then Armando, I see your question. Can you explain engage sessions per user? I get a 0.24 for my app, but don't know how to interpret that. Um, so again, this is something Armando, you might want to email me about, or if you can just add into the chat, like where are you seeing that in the list here? So I can understand the context. So like when you're in J4 and you see engage sessions per user, like where are you? Are you in engagement overview? Are you in acquisition somewhere? Um, if you could tell me, I can look at it um, and give you a little bit of feedback. Um, if there's any other questions, though, please feel free to drop them into the chat. I know some of you will have to go. So thank you again for being here. I'm so glad to have you all here. And great, Armando, I see that you're saying it's under the engagement overview. So let me just look in there and see if I can find something similar. Yeah, so you're saying the engaged sessions per user. So that's the average session count per active user selected, um, which is what Google literally tells me when I'm looking at this, right? Now, it's interesting because, so let me just repeat that. They're identifying that as the average session count per active user selected. So for me, that's hard because like, again, on the site that I'm looking at, I'm definitely getting less than one, right? The engaged session per user is 0.78. Um, this particular piece of data, I feel like it's gonna make more sense if an active user is looking, is visiting the site more times, Right, um, so I, I would have to dig into that a little bit more and understand your goals more. Cause like I'm looking at this site that I was showing you as an example. And the truth is 
I don't know if we care about this piece of data, <laughs> right? We've got events we want to track. We want to know the number of users. We want to know where we're getting the traffic. We want to know which pages they look at. So I haven't dug into exactly what this means. We do care about how many people are staying longer than 10 seconds, right? Which is kind of that um, just engaged user piece of data, but engaged sessions per user. You know, my question is how are they selecting the user? Um, you know, what kind of time period are they talking about? Uh, it looks like that's adjusted by the date. So feel free to email me and let me know a little bit more about what it is that you really want to track um, or what the questions are that you have that you're hoping the data can answer. And we can just have a quick conversation about what data might be the most valuable. Um, for me, when it comes to Google Analytics, I think it's really important to remember you don't need to look at every single piece of data potentially. You need to understand your goals, understand how your events relate to those goals, and understand basically what behavior is going to define success for you. And then you look at that actual data, right? Because, um, like, looking at this, you know, average engagement time per session, that makes sense. That lets me know, like, on average, how many people are, how long are people staying on the website, right? So, are they staying for a minute? Are they staying for, 30 seconds, are they staying for two minutes? Um, what is that? And then like the average engagement time is like that total average, um, you know, on average, how long does a person's, person stay there, um, right? So that's like an overview of the whole website versus looking at average engagement time per session, right? So because a session is like a visit to the website, the average engagement time is just like on average overall not per session, but maybe per user, are people staying on the site? But that engaged sessions per user, I don't quite understand um, why it's so low for everybody. That would be a great question. I'm glad to discuss that by email when you have time. Awesome. Well, again, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining me today. Um, thank you for all of those different questions. I really, really appreciate it. I will send out the recording along with the slide deck. And please, like I said, consider me a resource. Email me if there's anything specific that you'd like to talk about. I'm glad to share resources as much as I can. Um, and definitely dig into all the different uh, links and classes and different things. And if you get a chance, don't forget, please complete that survey link if you have time. It should take a minute or less. Um, and just let me know if we're interested in having a class on this topic where we dig more into things. I would love to know that. Um, I've shared that form link again for anybody who wants to complete the survey. But again, thank you all for the extra eight minutes. I deeply appreciate your time and for you being here. And I hope to see you at our next digital drop-in in September. Have a great rest of your Wednesday.